uh, but he sends his greetings. He's doing, uh, he's doing wonderfully. Um, I'm Carter Ham, and like, uh, like many in this room, I'm proud to say that I'm a soldier for life. <laughs> and I have some really good news this morning, and General Brown just reminded me of that. Uh, I'm not going to sing, all right? <laughs> Bill Ramsey, uh, I, I will tell you, the thought that was going through my mind is uh, uh, I would love to take you back with me uh, to inside the bubble that surrounds the capital, the nation's capital in Washington, D.C., about there's a bubble, extends about 30 miles. Your message would be most welcome inside that bubble. I can think There's lots of stars in this room uh, th this morning, and, and we would be here until lunchtime if we if we introduced all of them. So, uh, so I'm going to fall back on a, on a great international custom and one that I, I learned uh, as I was bouncing around in Africa, and that says simply, all protocol observed, all right? So if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a dignitary and you're all dignitaries, consider yourselves appropriately welcomed. Uh, so we're, we'll, save, we'll save ourselves a lot of time that way. Um, I would single out, though, a couple of, a, a couple of uh, groups rather than individuals. Uh, there are 28 nations, 29 nations, represented uh, at Land Forces Pacific 2017. 29. That's pretty powerful. Uh, and so I'd like the, the, the uh, representatives from all of the nations other than the United States. Would you please stand and allow us to welcome you and thank you for joining us here in Hawaii. Thank you so very much. Some of you have traveled uh, great distances to be here, uh, and I think that, that conveys the importance of this symposium, the fact that you chose to come. There are nine Army chiefs here. That's extraordinary, uh, that, the, that nine senior Army leaders or senior police leaders from their nations have taken the time to travel to this place at this, at this time. Many of them joined by their senior enlisted advisors. And if I could please ask the senior enlisted advisors uh, from, the, from the many nations that are here, would you please stand and allow us to thank you for your leadership of your non-commissioned officers. Those of us in the United States military, the officers at least, uh, many years ago learned that, that uh, if you want anything done, if you want it done well, you put a non-commissioned officer in charge of it, and that seems to work out, uh, work out pretty well, and the officers get out of the way, and the sergeants just get things done, and that works out, uh, works out pretty wonderfully. So we are very, very happy that, uh, that you are here. You know, Admiral Harris, the Pacific Command Commander, is, has been leading the United States in joint and multi-domain activities and operations. Uh, that's ever more evident than in this room. So in addition to the, the many United States Army uh, personnel who are gathered here, we welcome those from the other armed services of the United States, the United States Navy, United States Marine Corps, United States Air Force, United States Coast Guard. Thank you each uh, for being a valuable partner and and, and uh, trying to keep General Bob Brown out of trouble each and every day. We appreciate the, the joint efforts that are represented here this, this morning. The, uh, the, the, uh, we have a great agenda uh, set up for you uh, today, as Michael indicated. Uh, this agenda is dependent largely on your participation. You will make or break the success of Land Forces Pacific. If you engage intellectually, verbally, uh, and with your written comments, then this will be a very, very valuable uh, opportunity. We, we, look, we very much look forward to that. As Michael indicated, we are thankful for the many exhibitors who are here. They are a vital part of this symposium. It's a complement to, uh, to the, the professional dialogue and discussion that will occur in this room, but, but complemented by the extraordinary efforts and capabilities that are delivered by the exhibitors just next door. I encourage you to find time to go spend uh, 
a little bit of time and effort with them, learn what they're doing, uh, share your interest, uh, your observations with them. It's an integral part of Land Forces Pacific, and we have allocated time in the schedule to allow you uh, to engage with them. Among the many groups to, that, that I'm thankful for this morning is the Military Affairs uh, Committee of the Hawaii Chamber of, Com of Commerce, uh, without whose support uh, this conference uh, simply would not be possible. I'd especially like to thank Lidos, an AUSA sustaining member uh, for, uh, for their uh, breakfast and the general session amenities that will be provided for us. Lidos, thank you very much. How about a round of applause for them? I'm going to indicate or welcome just one particular individual by name, but I think you'll understand why. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, Sergeant Robert Miller. Uh, Sergeant Miller uh, is, uh, has been in the Army for four years. He's assigned to the 74th Explosive Ordnance Disposal Company and the th 303rd EOD Battalion, 8th Military Police Brigade, 8th Theater Sustainment Command, located here at uh, Schofield Barracks. In October of last year, in October of 2016, he was named the 2016 United States Army Best Warrior. Congratulations, Sergeant Miller. We're honored that you joined us. About five years ago, uh, the Chief of Staff of the Army, uh, at the time General Ray Odierno, asked uh, the Association of the United States Army and U.S. Army Pacific to design a forum to showcase the role of land power in the Pacific. We've done that here for the past four years, and we'll continue that tradition over the next three days. You know the background, the facts, and the factoids uh, that convey the importance of the Pacific region to the security of the United States. You know the long history of U.S. land forces, Army, Marine Corps, Special Operating Forces. You know that long history in, in this critical region. So you don't need me to, to recite all of those and because those of you in this room live that legacy each and every day. But recognizing the importance of the region uh, but also acknowledging that the ever the ever changing nature of the region, we've developed an agenda and a series of panels and a variety of topics of importance that I think you will find useful in the professional dialogue and discussion that will chart the way ahead. These forums provide unique opportunities to increase our understanding of the security environment, the role that land forces play in the region, and the requirements by military forces operating in this important part of the world. Land Forces Pacific is truly unique. There's no other similar forum in the region that focuses exclusively on land forces and land power. We'll continue to grow this important venue and seek to make it the premier forum of its kind. As you listen to the speakers and the panels uh, throughout the day, please keep uh, this in mind. While land power remains a critical element of a properly balanced joint and multinational force, land forces, despite all of our prejudices, simply cannot do things all by themselves. To achieve that balance, the Army, as well as the other military services, must have budget stability. AUSA, along with other like-minded associations and organizations, continues to advocate uh, for that budget stability, predictability, and sufficiency. We, could, we advocate for the complete repeal, repeal of sequestration, the removal of defense caps, but we need your help. Your support matters, and perhaps it matters now more than it has ever. Lend your voice, join or renew your membership. It matters, it matters a lot. And oh, by the way, you'll find that we're checking your membership status at the entrance to the restrooms. You'll find it much easier to get access if your membership is current. We really do need you. It's an important time. As you know, the Chief of Staff, General Milley, would be here, uh, but for his uh, presentation before the, the Congress on the day after, or on the day after tomorrow concerning uh, the, the recently released uh, defense budget. So these are critical times. The voice of the Pacific, the voices of land forces in the Pacific, is absolutely vital. So let's get LANPAC 2017 started. 
We're honored, I'm honored to introduce our, our very first speaker, uh, the commander of the United States Army Pacific, a uh, gifted leader, a marginal basketball player. Um, uh, only the truth comes from this podium, right? right? So we have to do that. Uh, and a guy that I'm, I'm privileged to call my friend of many years, uh, General Bob Brown. I would say uh, marginal is a compliment, sir, so I'll, I'll take it. Uh, well, aloha. aloha. Well, it's still early in the morning. Uh, let's try it again and really pour it into it. We're in Hawaii. There could be worse places to be. This is uh, paradise, no doubt about it. So let's try it again. Aloha. aloha. There we go. All right, we're fired up. I'm going to follow General Ham. I was going to go down every name of every dignitary, but I, I think uh, brilliant move, sir. All protocol observed. Uh, all our distinguished guests, we're so glad you're here. Uh, the fifth and no question will be the best uh, land forces Pacific uh, ever. So thank you very much for joining us. You know, uh, I've been fortunate enough to be at uh, every one of these in, uh, in different roles, but I will say that uh, it is incredibly productive and uh, we couldn't have a better backdrop when you look at what is going on in the world uh, and the need for uh, the theme of LANPAC, of course, the uh, joint and multinational, advancing joint and multinational cooperation and land forces. How could we get a better theme? Because together we can solve these complex problems. If we go at it separately, uh, we've got a real problem. So we're really glad you're here. Uh, and uh, no question that uh, the timing is perfect. I, I want to thank the Association of the United States Army uh, for putting this on. We couldn't, obviously couldn't do it without them. Uh, and I would also point out they have, we have just uh, tremendous participation from industry and uh, it's always exciting to go next door and see the latest and greatest and all those things that will help our uh, young soldiers, uh, uh, Marines, uh, and, uh, and help them in their tough tasks out there and see the many uh, contributions from industry. So I just encourage you to make sure you stop next door and uh, take the time and we appreciate uh, that great participation. We appreciate uh, really a great forum uh, with discussions from senior enlisted forum to technology uh, and then uh, again a lot on uh, multilateral operations and the, the, how key it is uh, to work together. It really uh, being the focus, uh, lots of uh, great discussions in that area. So let me get started. I want to uh, talk a little bit about how the world has changed and how it's really changing the character of war. Uh, and I'll start uh, a little uh, background uh, and I'll show you uh, uh, from 2004 to 2014 the internet. What you're seeing there is not lights throughout the world but connectivity on the internet. And if you see uh, in the beginning, this is uh, 2014, there it is in the beginning, small numbers, and look at that incredible growth of connectivity. This is changing uh, how information is passed rapidly, how information diffuses rapidly, and has a significant impact uh, as you look at the connectivity around the world. And uh, no doubt exponentially increasing, uh, and this is changing. We'll take a look at... Uh, some of the statistics when you look in uh, the brown circles there are people uh, on earth, the number of people. And you can see back in 2003, more people than things connected to the internet, which is in blue. 2008, we had a real shift, a tipping point. More things connected to the internet than people on earth. And in three short years, we're, we're almost there, 2020, 50 billion things will be connected to the internet. 50 billion things. Now, this would be a tremendous good news story if everybody connected to the Internet had pure intentions and was doing good things. This would be wonderful. Unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, lies and rumors, recruiting, there's all kinds of stuff going on with this connectivity. We, you know, again, it would be wonderful. It was all good. And there's some great things that come from it. But fundamentally changing uh, the very character of many things within our society, but certainly war, uh, the character of war affected by this. And if you take a look, this velocity of human interaction, 
the global complexity is greater than ever. The democratization of information, where used to be only certain nation states could get info, now it's available to anyone. And uh, the speed in which things happen is absolutely changed uh, and having a huge impact. Uh, for example, uh, when I was younger, the fog of war was not enough information. You only got one or two pieces of information. Actually, it was a little bit easier to have initiative. The old, we used to have a saying, do something, do anything, Lieutenant, and nobody would second guess you because you'd only have one or two pieces of information. Today, what's the fog of war? Anybody? Too much information. Uh, absolutely overwhelming amounts of information. And the key is how do you, and, and oh, by the way, initiative is tougher because there are people that are second guessing you and the information is available. And it's a different way to train. It's a different way to educate individuals on how do you find that golden needle in the haystack of information. Uh, the, uh, the ability of information to move rapidly uh, has caused uh, challenges such as those that would do us harm in some cases can move much faster than we can. Uh, some individuals, you know, if you're not worried about telling the truth, you can leverage this connectivity uh, and move things very rapidly. Telling the truth takes longer. You've got to verify information. So we actually have a case in point uh, where uh, those that would do us harm can move information faster than us and certainly uh, share, and we know that uh, it's changed the very nature. We used to say, you know, do the right thing when no one is watching. And it's still a good principle. Certainly that gets after character and that you want. But really what's happening now is uh, you've got to do the right thing because the whole world is watching. Uh, and I would say in conflict, there'll never be another, be it a humanitarian assistance, disaster response, or uh, any, any type of conflict. Uh, there won't be any information that isn't tweeted, text, blogged, videotaped uh, available. Some of you may have flown on uh, United Airlines, and I want to pick on them and use that as an example. Uh, you know, how rapidly did that spread, uh, the uh, inadvertent changing of seats? And I hope that didn't happen to any of you there. Uh, uh, but, uh, but you can see the ability of information to move rapidly and have a significant impact uh, has changed uh, significantly. You know, they used to uh, have a, uh, if you were a lousy planner, if you didn't predict what was happening, many of us when we were younger, you know, if you couldn't predict what was going to happen, you just had failed. That's kind of gone away, and things called black swans, those high-impact events uh, that are hard to predict, rare events uh, beyond the realm of expectations, but they're becoming the norm. When you take a look, if you go back in time, uh, examples would be the Spanish flu in World War I uh, that came out of nowhere and caught folks by surprise and caused major issues. A 911 would be an example. And just a few weeks ago, how about the uh, uh, Wanna Cry ransom, which affected 150 countries. Again, coming out of nowhere, you couldn't really anticipate it. But interesting in this, one information technology expert, Marcus Hutchins, on his own, uh, single-handedly in the UK, he created a kill switch. He found a, a weakness and created a kill switch to stop the attack before it spread even worse. So again, the power of the individual, uh, very interesting, growing, uh, but the connectivity and really these black swans events out of nowhere uh, starting to become the norm, not the exception, is what we're seeing in the world. So let's take a look at that complexity in the Pacific. Uh, if you look at this, there's a circle there that doesn't even represent all of uh, the Pacific area of responsibility, obviously. It's a circle uh, in a portion of it. We, uh, we like to say the Pacific AOR, 36 countries, 16 time zones, is massive. It goes from Hollywood to Bollywood, you know, from polar bears to penguins. And in this circle, though, not even all of the Pacific, but more people live in that circle than in the rest of the world put together. I'll say that again, more people inside that circle than the rest of the world put together. So that gives you, you can see, tremendous opportunity within that circle, tremendous challenges and competition as well for resources and things like that. But uh, pretty soon, uh, you know, just uh, 2050, they said seven out of 10 people in the world will live in that circle. So the Pacific, why does the Pacific matter? 
uh, as is mentioned by General Ham, seven out of 10 largest armies in the world in the Pacific. Mega cities, a city of 10 million or more, uh, it's very surprising, 36 in the world right now, and those will grow uh, significantly in the next 20 years. But there's 36 right now in the world, 24 of those mega cities are in the Pacific, 24 of 36 within the world. So yes, there is a lot of blue, and the oceans are important. They carry that trade and uh, a huge chunk, uh, well over uh, one in every $3 spent on defense is spent in the Pacific, and, and uh, about half of the, of the trade, uh, when you look total trade routing through the Pacific, the water's important, but people do live on the land in those 24 megacities within the Pacific. Uh, so within the Pacific, we have identified, you know, as the United States, five challenges our nation faces. Uh, four of the five are in the Pacific. And this one you're well aware of, it is the most uh, daunting challenge right now and uh, the most significant, uh, Kim Jong-un. Uh, interestingly, I was briefing this to some cadets, uh, young cadets, and talking about this, and they were really impressed. They said, wow, sir, how'd you get that picture? That's pretty impressive. They had visions of a little mini UAV flying behind Kim Jong-un there. And I said, if that were the case, we'd be able to take care of the problem much easier. So, uh, uh, but obviously, uh, he's after maintaining his regime, and he's after a new capability. And if you look at the number of launches, this chart here shows the number of launches. I mean, it's absolutely uh, incredible. This is the capability he's after. 80 here within the last couple of years, more than his father and grandfather by 300 times. He's after a capability to reach out. He's uh, taken the chance with his conventional forces and getting that asymmetric uh, missile, and as we all know, uh, looking for uh, that nuclear capability to reach out. And, it, and when you think about the challenges here, it's the only place in the world a million soldiers on each side of the DMZ are postured, uh, a million on each side. Uh, so uh, while, uh, you know, the challenges are great, I'm very encouraged by the fact, again, that 29 nations are here nine chiefs of armies, because we've got to solve these complex challenges together. These things no longer impact small numbers. They impact everybody. Uh, the, the connectivity causes it to impact the entire world, and no question about it. And then you have revisionist, revanchist powers, uh, some that want to revise uh, the, the, uh, the international rules and norms, some that have almost a, a revenge against uh, what, what's happened uh, and want to come back. And uh, as you see there, I often wonder, are they, are they toasting with vodka or uh, Chinese baijiu? I don't know. But, and what are they smiling about is the next thing I always kind of wonder. But uh, some challenges. Let me start with Russia. You know, just recently we had uh, the Bear Bombers right outside Alaska. Not too long ago, they encircled Japan uh, completely with, with bombers. And it's been uh, several years since we've had continuous operations. We had to get uh, uh, intercepts of uh, U.S. jets up there uh, because of the aggressive actions. And then aggressive actions in the Arctic and, again, throughout the Pacific. Some people kind of forget Russia is in the Pacific. It absolutely is. And then China. Uh, you know, competition doesn't necessarily mean conflict at all. But, but we are concerned... Uh, that uh, are their words matching their actions. This is uh, Spratly uh, Island's fiery reef cross in 2006. You know, at uh, high tide, those rocks aren't even above the water line. It's not an island. Uh, but now look 10 years later, and this is uh, fiery cross reef 10 years later with, uh, you know, a runway, uh, an incredible capability, petroleum storage, munition storage, housing for troops, on and on. However, the, the, the word is we're not going to militarize the South China Sea, but yet we, we see it in actions uh, uh, and uh, significant uh, over time here. Then you have challenges. Uh, I wish I could say we didn't have this challenge in the Pacific, but as violent extremist organizations are being pushed out of traditional areas, they're moving into the Pacific, uh, and they're moving into areas. They're trying to find areas that can, they can go and hide and regroup and form. And unfortunately, we have violent extreme organizations, about 30 recently just pledged to Daesh or ISIL here over the last six months within the Pacific. So this is a challenge we face. And then the most likely event that could occur within the Pacific, of course, is a disaster. This is a Typhoon uh, Daimayan that, uh, that hit the Philippines. 
I think the, the uh, you know, the, the challenge here is seven out of every 10 people uh, in the world who are killed in a disaster, it's in the Pacific, uh, you know, because of the rim of fire and the challenges we face. The good news in this, in this terrible news, the good news is that all nations in the Pacific work together, uh, every single nation, to save lives. And there, there are no, uh, no issues that arise. Everyone works together to save lives in a disaster response. And it's a great example for other within the region uh, and uh, no, no doubt that it's, uh, it's a key example and area we have to emphasize. So those are some of the challenges. What do, how do we get after some of this? And I would submit for all of us for what's happened, the ability to share information rapidly. If you take a look at this, if North Korea, for example, were to launch a, a conventional attack, uh, the existing material solutions that our nations have uh, the sending states, those that would be involved on the peninsula, we defeat uh, North Korea, you know, no question, with the existing material solutions that we have. But even North Korea, like many others, are not going after strengths, they're going after weaknesses. So you look and they're, they're, they're sharing information rapidly, so you get to more amorphous, ambiguous threats over here. The material solutions uh, purposely uh, don't give you that advantage. We, not, and don't get me wrong, we want the best material, we want the best equipment, but it only provides you so much of an advantage today. I mean, I go back to when, for example, uh, uh, several nations in here, we owned the night, you know, 25 years ago. We were the only ones that had the ability to see at night. Now you can purchase that on the internet and, and better than we can get through our acquisition systems. You can purchase just about everything. You can 3D print items. So we need the best technology. Uh, but it's only going to last so long, so we've got to take a look at how do we get the best equipment and then the people, and you look at the demand, so much greater. This is no longer the pure rote repetition, just do as I say. This requires soldiers, leaders who are agile, who can solve those complex problems in a timely manner with a creative solution. And as we look at this uncertainty out there, the black swan, The armies, U.S. armies, hedge against uncertainty. Professionals, professional being absolutely key, uh, who thrive in conditions of ambiguity is not good enough as we move in. They've got to thrive. Um, and uh, one of my examples I use, if there are any foot American U.S. Super Bowl, uh, and I know it hurts the Atlanta fans to bring this up, but clearly Tom Brady was thriving in the second half. That's the example of thriving. I'm not even a Patriot fan, but I can tell you that is an example of thriving in ambiguity and chaos uh, and uh, having that uh, confidence and understanding and building on it in such a dire situation. So it's absolutely key, and the, what we put on that soldier, you, you know, it puts uh, an increased value in education leader development, tough, demanding, realistic training that's not just road repetition, it's outcomes-based, it's making them solve those complex problems. Uh, good news is we're getting help from folks and uh, from industry and live, virtual, constructive and gaming, getting that realism, we're getting a lot of help and training and, and so uh, we can get those soldiers to the point where they thrive in ambiguity and chaos. But what's absolutely key is multinational solutions it alone. You'd be foolish. None of our nations should do it alone. And that's the encouraging thing, again, of 29 nations being here as we work together. Different perspectives, different approaches are critical to these tough problems. And so together, uh, we have to be able to solve these extremely complex problems with soldiers, by the way, uh, who work together well, and that includes interoperability, where we're getting, again, getting help from industry, the ability to work together, and there's several parts of that interoperability. There's the technical part of it, where we need help from industry, and they're giving us that help of connecting things together, being able to have uh, you know, the sensors and shooters tied together and able to talk and communicate with each other between nations. And it's not easy, it takes a lot of work. Uh, and then there's the policy aspect of interoperability. Policies that often restrict, I remember when I was a first corps commander in a talisman saber, 
Uh, the Australian forces were authorized to be in our net. It still took them two hours a day to log in. Uh, it was actually would have been faster to use a carrier pigeon because of policies slowing things down. So the policies can slow things down. Now, I don't, I don't think we'll ever get the technology and the policies perfect. But we've got to do better, and we've got to work that. But the bigger part of it, the part that gives me hope, are the people. Because the technology and policy will always be working. But somehow the, the individuals get together, the soldiers, understanding the commander's intent, they get together and they're able to solve the problems. So as you look at technology and policy, we've got to work on it. We've got to work together to figure out what technology needs to change, needs to talk to each other, needs to share information from intelligence to data sharing to get at these challenges of this complex world with overwhelming amounts of information. Then we've got to look at what policy needs to change. We've got to push. We've got to be able to push those that would uh, hold us back because they have to understand if we can't have the policies, all you're doing is favoring the enemy, those who would do us harm. So we really have to push in those areas. But when it comes, push comes to shove, we'll work those hard and we have to, but the real key is going to be the people, uh, the people that will bring it together. Empowered by mission command, which... Every army I've worked with in the Pacific is either already there or moving that direction. How do you empower your people? You build that trust. You make sure they understand the commander's intent. You discuss what's prudent risk, and then you empower them. If you don't do this, you can't be successful in the future. You cannot. You will always be behind. You'll be a victim of complexity, uh, and we want to be masters of complexity. So mission command is so important, and that empowerment gives us the advantage as we work together with different viewpoints, different understandings, solving these complex problems. And as you look, again, technology that empowers our people, absolutely key. You know, that's the third offset when you look. It's that technology that empowers them to make decisions faster, whether it's you know, capitalizing on artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, big data, but enables us, empowers our people, and take them from victims, you see there in that unmanned aerial system swarm that would be difficult, to masters of complexity where we can get after it and not be victims of it. So the people are key, but you also need the concepts and the doctrine. And that's what we'll have a lot of discussion. The next panel will really focus on what's emerging for us is this concept of multi-domain battle. We're no longer dominant in all domains. None of our armies are dominant in all domains anymore. So we have to have a way that we can make up for those areas where we're not dominant anymore and we can work together and it requires an incredible effort in joint integration. We currently are dependent on each other and for us, the U.S. and many of your nations, we work joint consistently. We work joint, we work multinational consistently and, and uh, we're getting better, but we gotta go even further. If we're going to deal with these challenges out there where we have complex A2, AD threats near peers who are presenting these dilemmas to us, the only way we can solve it is by those concepts and doctrine that will get us there, ability to create multiple dilemmas for the enemy and provide multiple options for our command authority. Uh, but that requires an integration that, uh, quite honestly, has never been seen before in history, but I'm incredibly encouraged. Uh, uh, Admiral Harris pushing us to move towards this and tremendous component commanders like I see uh, Admiral Swift, General Shaughnessy just uh, uh, came in uh, working together in ways uh, never before uh, seen and we'll solve the problem and we'll get there so that we can uh, hopefully uh, present uh, the ability to that deterrent factor where nobody be stupid enough to attack any of our nations because uh, our efforts together, our working together, and our options. But I go back to uh, the people from all our countries, how important, critical they are in solving these problems. The individuals working together, exercises as they're out there are so key. Engagements, every single engagement, absolutely critical. And working in a way so that we're figuring out how to get after these problems, listening to different perspectives, different solutions, and solving those complex problems in a timely manner with a creative solution because those closest to the problem that you see there, those soldiers that we're all privileged uh, to lead, will have the solution and, and uh, understand and be able to thrive in that complexity. So uh, really look forward to the discussions throughout the, the conference, throughout the symposium where we get after how do we get, how do we increase that interoperability? 
How do we increase uh, uh, the ability to work together? And how do we empower uh, these soldiers that are our advantage? How do we ensure that they can actually solve the challenges? Because that's what's required. Uh, I know this will shock everybody, but it's not the generals or the admirals at the higher level. It's those closest to the problem will have the best solution. And do we have the type force where we can get that input and disseminate it rapidly uh, to solve those complex problems? Uh, and uh, I would tell you that the good news is, yes, we do. We just have to work it. We have to push it. Uh, and we have to work together. You can't do it alone. So uh, thanks so much again for joining us as we, uh, throughout the week, we'll work this theme of uh, uh, land forces working together, joint, multinational, solving these complex problems that are out there in this, in this changing world that we all face. And uh, we'll start. Go into a little more detail on multi-domain battle and the uh, key efforts that are ongoing to tackle these tough. No, I'd be happy to take questions now, but I'm going to timeline timeline wise. I think we'll have time for a couple questions while next panel. All right. Hopefully, this is an easy one to start off. I think I had some of my guys. I said that, like that, but we'll see. All right. What are the challenges uh, we are facing in synchronizing our efforts in multi-domain battle with regards to joint coalition operations today and in the future. So uh, really uh, gets after, uh, uh, and that's uh, John Munoz Atkinson. Thanks, John, for that question. So what are the challenges we're facing today? And I will tell you, there's, there's a couple big ones. We all grow up, all our services grow up in stovepipes. Uh, and you understand your service extremely well. But the systems are designed in the United States and service, and they're designed for service solutions, not necessarily joint solutions. So one thing is we don't know enough uh, about the other services. The other is you're starting uh, really at a deficit because you're looking from your perspective only, uh, and uh, it requires an incredible joint perspective. And I think you'll hear, uh, uh, not to put any pressure, not so, but I think you'll hear Admiral Swift talk. He has, I steal it all the time. He has a great thing. He says, we've got to be sensor agnostic and platform, platform agnostic. So it doesn't matter whether it's a, a Navy P3 picking up a target and, a, and an Army uh, artillery system engaging it or vice versa and, uh, you know, an Apache picking it up and a ship at sea. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, uh, but we can't get there yet. We, we have the challenges of the technical uh, but we have the mindset challenge uh, would be the biggest challenge to truly get at joint integration. Uh, and it's a change, and that, that's difficult. But we've got to go from interdependence to integration. Okay, any uh, others, Michael? Okay, good. So what we'll do, I think that's great, because what we'll do is uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Charlie Flynn, and we'll get right into the first panel, which is an all-star panel. He'll introduce uh, these superstars on the panel with me. I'm honored to be a part. And again, Thank you very much uh, for uh, attending. You traveled a long way here to the middle of the Pacific. I'm certain it'll be worth it. And uh, we look forward to the dialogue this week. We look forward to the questions. And the more questions and, uh, and uh, activity we can get back and forth, uh, the better we'll all uh, uh, come out of this and the, and the closer we will be to solving these complex problems. So thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get right into this. I'm going to just do a little framing up front. I would make uh, mention, so I think uh, Michael's going to walk around with cards, and uh, Mike can uh, hand the cards to me here. I'll, I'll uh, distribute those as best as possible. I also would make a comment that this is being live streamed, and there'll be questions that come in off live streaming. So, um, uh, Mike, they may pass one of those to you, or I may get those separately, and I'll uh, distribute those as, as necessary. So I'm, uh, I'm just going to sort of set the stage as we sort of change channels to our, our first panel here. So last year at this time, um, uh, Admiral Harris came here and basically said, hey, listen, I need the Army and or land forces to be able to sink ships, neutralize satellites, satellites shoot down missiles, deny enemy C-2 of forces, and restrict maritime movement. I think that was about a week after General Brown took command. And... Uh, and I have borne witness to uh, the gentlemen and these, uh, these great warriors here at this, uh, at this panel all working incredibly diligently together as a team 
to try to solve some of those problems because those missions that, uh, that the comm placed on our, uh, in our rucksack, so to speak, are, uh, are not easily solved. In fact, uh, there's a, some capability mismatch that goes along with it. I would also say that uh, General Brown, uh, to us, uh, uh, working with the Army, has also added to us the... Uh, and uh, as you just uh, listened to him this morning, he added uh, a, a piece of that to his uh, delivery this morning to sort of open things up. And so for a lot of reasons that uh, were touched on earlier by General Brown, I'll just say a few other things that make this point as to why this uh, topic is so very important. So rise and resurgence of near-peer competitors, <clears throat> increasing need for rapid force projection, increasing need for multiple flexible response options in crisis, and an increasing need for credible deterrent capabilities. There's a wide proliferation of high-end technologies that, that challenge our historical domain dominance. And then, of course, anti-access area denial, terror strikes, sabotage, offensive and these are just to name a few. And recent senior leaders in the armies, in our, in our army, have testified that we are outmanned, outranged, outgunned, and out of position. So multi-domain battle seeks to create joint, integrated, and combined arms operations across all domains, with land forces bringing additional joint force capabilities in the deep, close, and support areas, providing a wider array of tactical and operational solutions to strategic problems. Land forces will not operate independently, and this is not about any one service substituting for another. Rather, it's about extending the operational reach of all joint force capabilities in order to achieve favorable outcomes for the U.S. and our allies. So with that as an appetizer, let me introduce this extraordinary pa panel of leaders. Uh, as mentioned earlier, my boss, Commanding General of the United States Army Pacific Command, General Robert Brown. We're also pleased to have uh, General uh, Toshia Okabe, the Chief of Staff of the Japanese Ground Self-Defense Force. General J David Perkins, Commanding General of Trading and Doctrine Command. Admiral Scott Swift, Commander of U.S. Pacific Fleet. General Ter Terrence O'Shaughnessy, Commander of Pacific Armed Forces and the Air Component Commander for United States Pacific Command. And Major Dan Yu, Commander, Special Operations Command, Force Pacific. So with that, sir, uh, over to you, General Brown, to uh, start the panel off. We're going to go five minutes on each of the uh, speakers, and then we'll get into questions. Thank you. Well, the good news is, and some of you may find this hard to believe, but I will not take my five minutes uh, since I just had the uh, opening address. I just want to tee up a couple key issues. Uh, when we look at this concept, uh, there's no question that it's, it's evolutionary change. Uh, it, it can lead to a, a revolutionary impact, no question, but it's evolutionary change. You look back to the uh, you know, Battle of Vicksburg uh, was, was uh, not capable, not possible, uh, a victory there, Grant, uh, from the land alone. He had to use the river and the, and the naval assets. Uh, and so we've seen this uh, throughout time uh, go forward to uh, air land battle, and there's some that would describe uh, what we're looking at as kind of air land battle plus a few other domains. You know, it's just a few other domains added in there. And uh, so, but it does require uh, that mindset change is the first and most important aspect. Uh, that certainly, uh, you know, no one's saying we need experts in, in the services and we need folks that are looking at how do you solve those problems, but also requires a look beyond uh, your uh, area of expertise uh, and collaboration and cooperation with others. And this is a huge lesson we've seen, uh, as I mentioned, as the world has become more complex. Things that used to be able to be solved uh, fairly simply in, in several domains uh, now, uh, that's not the case, and, and things you could solve as an individual service uh, nation, you can't. Uh, it, it requires uh, complex cooperation uh, and real collaboration to get after these tough issues. It requires empowered leaders is the other aspect of this. Uh, it, it, uh, you know, we shifted uh, from uh, uh, a system of command and control, uh, which was very strict and uh, empowered to some extent, but not nearly enough. And we realized in 2008, in the middle of two wars in the U.S. Army, that we, we had to empower. We were too slow 
compared to those that would do us harm. And so we really had to move to a, a philosophy of mission command of empowerment, which we've seen all of our services move to, calling it slightly different things, but clearly empowering those uh, uh, that make the decisions. And as you look at this uh, joint integration, uh, you know, it is absolutely key. It's joint and it's multinational, which, you know, joint integration alone is tough, but then multinational, and again, getting at that interoperability, working those technical solutions, working those policies, and then the people that will solve it, uh, no question, long before the technology and the policies, but that doesn't mean we don't need uh, the efforts on the on the policies. It requires, and this is a tough one, but uh, an acquisition system that's much more agile than we've had in the past, uh, a little more rapid acquisition, no question. And we have organizations that have sprung up uh, in, in the United States military to help us with that, the Strategic Capabilities Office, and most of the services have a, a rapid capabilities office uh, emerging. It's kind of a shame we have to do that to get a more rapid acquisition, but, but we do because of the system we have. Uh, and when you, when you get to, uh, to the end, you'll have ability to present multiple dilemmas and, and uh, not be as predictable, which is absolutely critical, and maneuver to positions of relative advantage, uh, not for long term, uh, but for that ability to leverage the domains and get to a position of advantage against an adversary that would do you harm. And again, that requires that incredible cooperation and collaboration. But the good news is we're seeing it happen. Uh, we're leading the way here in the Pacific, the only combatant command where all the commanders are together, and that's a great thing because we get together frequently and work uh, these challenging issues and this particular issue, which applies throughout the world, by the way, not just in the Pacific, but certainly applies here in the Pacific. So I look forward to, uh, I want to uh, pass my time uh, to the folks on my left and right who uh, really have uh, tremendous perspectives on this, and again, you've heard me uh, already in the keynote, uh, my role in this. So let me uh, forfeit my time, and I won't even ask for it back, and I'm really excited to hear uh, from this tremendous panel. General Covey, sir. <clears throat> First, I would like to express my sincere appreci appreciation for arriving, uh, allowing, uh, allowing uh, me to attend the PAM with these general officers from the U.S. forces to speak on behalf of the Japan Ground Self Defense Force regarding its multi domain embargo in the Indo Asia Pacific region from the view of an ally. At the beginning, let me outline our multi domain battle. How to counter potential adversaries' A to AD capabilities in the region is a challenge that the JGSDF and the U.S. Army face today while developing multi domain battle. As Chief of Staff JGSDF, I have two solutions as follows. First, we build the walls to deny and defend against potential adversaries A to AD capabilities. The walls do not simply defend Japan, but deny A to AD capabilities along so-called first and second island chains, chains, as well as protecting the U.S. forward bases for their power projection. Second. We promote security cooperation, demonstrating Japan value, what a competence, a competence to keep the stability of the region. These two are what we do as modern domain battle. In the concept, we consider human domain as a sixth domain. It is where we capitalize our quality to exercise the effects uh, gained through building human bonds with neighboring, neighboring countries, including human dimension, uh, being discussed in the U.S. Army. Next, I will explain how we operate more than battle 
linked with the U.S. Army. The JGSDF will build the walls by placing capable units throughout the country, including remote islands, newly establishing amphibious forces, exercising cross-domain capabilities, such as surface to ship, missile to maritime domain, as well as middle-range surface to air missile to effective range of SSM and in cyberspace and the EMS domain. While protecting U.S. forward bases for their power projection, we expect the U.S. Army to reinforce it. The U.S. Army also create and exploit windows of advantage of, to, uh, of advantage to enable freedom of maneuver to counter A280. Meantime, we will support the U.S. Army to create the windows. To realize these, Japan-U.S. cross-domain fire is a key factor. This is how we implement our modern battle through joint operations with the U.S. forces in the area surrounding Japan. Under the current situation, such Japan-U.S. bilateral modern domain battle must be very effective against North Korea. I would also like to build up current posture by enhancing Japan-U.S. Republic of Korea trilateral cooperation. We should utilize and expand the premier bilateral exercise, Yamasakura and Orient Shield, as a test rise for the Japan-U.S. bilateral motor domain battle. Favorably, cooperating with Australia in the battle outside of Japan's territory is taking advantage of Japan value. This is motor domain battle operations that outside of its territory, Japan can only contribute, uh, contribute to the region in the on the government guidelines. We naturally have an affinity to Country and have capabilities that can support battles in all domains. To human domain backed uh, by those capabilities, we will provide security uh, cooperation to ASEAN and other countries in the region, especially capacity building assistance, as well as effort to join training and exercise with partners. We are also looking for opportunities to cooperate with India in terms of security cooperation in the region. Additionally, it is important that the JGSDF will practice motor domain battle in human domain, not by itself, but with the United States as well as Australia and other nations to support their regional engagement complementary. Uh, this concludes my introduction to our modern battle and cooperation with the U.S. Army based on the Japan-U.S. alliance and the teamworks with the U.S. Army and Marine Corps. The JGSDF will expand its cooperation with other countries such as Australia and India in order to contribute to the peace and stability of the Indo-Asia Pacific region. Thank you. General Perkins, sir. Thanks, Mike. Um, <coughs> as I was going over my schedule last week with my team, they said, sir, you're gonna go out to LAMPAC, you're gonna be on a panel, we're gonna talk about the domain battle, you know, what slides do you want us to put together, et cetera. I said, well, we, 
I'm sure the reason they all came there is because they were hoping for an 80 PowerPoint slide, tradition like presentation <laughs> with sort of these ethereal, impossible to do concepts and doctrine. Uh, so I wouldn't want to disappoint. So we, we could go down that route. However, that would take a long time. Uh, it would take a lot of preparation and seriously cut into my time available to drink Mai Tais by the pool. <laughs> So I said, hey, how about this? What if I steal Bob Brown's slides and just say what General Okabe said here? <laughs> and then that'll really cut down on our preparation time. So if you could put up Bob Brown's slide <laughs> on the internet, we'll see how agile the folks are. I don't know, they may have already shredded that. Uh, so I, I just want to make a couple points here. Uh, and I have a, a session tomorrow uh, on multi-domain battle, and so uh, I'll get into the, the finer points of that. But so as we go around and, and we rolled out multi-domain battle uh, last October at AUSA, so again, General Ham, thanks for your organization's leadership to provide these venues, or else, as I said, we would never roll anything out because that's when it always comes out during AUSA events. Um, so it's been out maybe eight months now, and, and you can see it's on just about every slide. No, the slide with the internet, uh, with, you know, that started from, yeah, is that, I don't know if we got that one. Anyways, it's fresh in your mind. Um, and so I, I get a lot of, okay, that's all great, but what's, what are some of the differences about this? Is, and I'll talk about this tomorrow. I get a lot of, well, it's old wine in a new bottle and just kind of doing the same thing. There's some truth to that, but there's a couple of significant differences. Um, and I think the first one is how you think about the problem is uh, uh, General Hamm's predecessor, General Sullivan, always encourages us to when we think about change, the intellectual leads to physical. And I would like to talk about some of the intellectual change pieces of this. Now, so we, a lot of us grew up in that paradigm of uh, uh, detect, decide, deliver, then assess. That you look out and you're trying to detect the bad guy, then you go through and decide what you're going to do to them, and then you deliver some type of fact, and then you assess the effectiveness of that delivery. I, I think. That, that is, and, but that's very linear. You can, even just the way we talk about it, it's very linear. Tends to be sort of a multi-domain thing. I got a land problem, and you know, am I going to send Alpha Company after Bravo Company artillery? And not only is that linear, multi-domain, it actually becomes easy to mitigate against. But we are still thinking that way. So if you take a look at uh, this picture here with the internet and showing all the connectivity. Oh, by the way, that one little black spot of no connectivity, that's my government Blackberry that seems to crash on a daily <laughs> basis there. But um, you can see that actually detecting is no longer really becoming that difficult. In fact, a lot of people put it as one of the weaknesses of our network because you admit you're constantly connected. So actually, I can detect you anywhere. And uh, was in a meeting last week at the Pentagon, and they're talking about our network, and you know that, that's going to be one of our Achilles heels. And so, to use a maritime example, since we're in a significantly maritime intensive theater, that they say, you know, if we have a ship out there and we're trying to control all emissions from it, so it can't be detected. But you know, every now and then, you're going to have the chief petty officer Bob Brown who decides to turn on his iPhone and you know. FaceTime with his grandkids or something. No, now I can detect them. Now, now I can decide to do something and deliver. And I said, okay, so we, what we, how do we solve that? Well, we need more UCMJ authority. We really need to get Bob Brown on board, take his iPhone, et cetera. See, I, I think that's a failed strategy because in the end, the map's going to look like this in that instead of detecting, instead of trying to find just the one single Bob Brown, which actually is pretty easy, what if you had 10,000 Bob Browns? Scary thought as that is. But, um, and you say, you know what? I, I'm letting everyone emit, and now what I'm trying to do, I'm, instead of focusing on detecting, I have to discriminate. I have to discriminate amongst all of these signals out there. Now that actually takes a lot longer, a lot more capability, analytical capability, et cetera, like that. Because if I'm looking for a needle in a haystack, once I find the needle, I know it's a needle, because it doesn't look like any of the other hay. If you say, I'm looking for a needle in a pile of needles, that becomes much more difficult. So we have to, I think, dramatically change how we are dealing with that problem set. And when you can do that through multiple domains, you now start to overload the enemy's capability, not to detect, but to discriminate what is really important out there and what really makes a difference. Because then you get to the decide part. And you can't really decide unless you've discriminated amongst all that you've detected. And I think 
just deciding is not enough anymore. What we really have to do is discriminate and out-decide. I have to decide not only the best solution, I have to decide quicker and run through many more options quicker than my enemy can keep up with it. So while any decision may not be the optimum decision at any point in time, I am constantly out deciding the enemy and I'm going through a range of options through multiple domains that is leaving the enemy sort of in my dust because they're approaching it from a linear point of view and I'm really approaching this from a three-dimensional point of view and I'm presenting them a problem set that they are detecting everything, literally everything. They just can't discriminate what's important and, not what, and what is not important and they have a decision paradigm set up that it requires them to detect exactly a certain thing to decide. If they can't detect it, then they can't decide. Whereas we're operating at the point I'm trying to discriminate what's not important, focus on what's important. I have multiple options in multiple domains with multiple coalition partners, and I can move through those much faster than the enemy can come up with me. Because as Mike said, you, you hear testimony, we're outranged, outgunned, et cetera, like that. I'm not necessarily, again, trying to go tit for tat for every artillery piece, every tank, et cetera, like that. I am just trying to have more options then the enemy can, and as soon as one of my options is no longer valid, I just switch to another one. And then they sort of have to keep up with that. And then the last part on the assess, instead of assessing the effect of a single problem that I delivered, what, am I, what I am assessing is my ability to out-decide and move through options faster than the enemy. So I'm not focusing an assessment on a single effect from a single weapon system or a single domain, I'm assessing my ability to quickly get to something that the enemy can't deal with. And in many ways, that plays the strength of the people in this room from a number of uh, points. One, our leader development system, because I think one of the asymmetric advantages we have is the way we develop leader and we empower them, and Bob Brown just talked about that from a mission command point of view. The other part, General Okabe talked about with regards to our coalition folks, is he said, if if, if we work with them and can present our own sort of A2, AD capability, and then from there can project dilemmas out to the enemy from a multi-coalition point of view, that is going to be very difficult for our enemy to mitigate because along with our coalition partners, they're having to deal with multiple domains and multiple capacities from our coalition folks, which then requires, as we train together, as is being done in many venues here in the Pacific, we have already worked through how we are going to move through our range of options and how we are going to discriminate on those things that are most important. And so when we start assessing things, we aren't focused just on an effect of one domain and wep one weapon system. We're assessing our ability to work together as a coalition. We're assessing our ability to have a common understanding of the problem set. We're assessing our ability to make decisions and then execute them quickly. It's not just the assessment of any one system, it's the assessment to understand, discriminate, and pull all of this together, uh, which puts a premium, quite honestly, on events like this and all the training exercises going on in the Pacific, because you've got to get the leaders together and get this common vision, as General Sullivan says, the intellectual leads the physical. Get this intellectual framework down. How do we go about building that? And then eventually you'll have weapon systems and you know, ships and airplanes, et cetera, like that. But that, that's really further down the process. It's this intellectual piece at the beginning that I think is really going to give us a leg up to deal with this world uh, that Bob so kindly painted so I didn't have to build a PowerPoint slide. So <laughs> with that, I'll pass it back off to the rest of my panel. Great, thank you. Admiral Swift, sir. <laughs> Great to share some uh, some time with you this morning, and I've I uh, had some thoughts on what I wanted to share coming into the conference, and already I have a long list of uh, of new thoughts uh, based on the discussion, uh, both Bob's uh, presentation and the, the panelists that have gone uh, before me. Um, I'm really interested in in getting to your uh, questions, so I'm going to be fairly brief and. Uh, uh, but share a, a few perspectives. I think, first of all, when I think in, in terms of multi-domain battle, 
Um, I think of it in, in the context of, uh, of PACOM, you know, the, the uh, area of responsibility of, of us collectively and, and Admiral Harris uh, singularly. The, uh, but if you think of uh, multi-domain battle from a global uh, perspective, that's a little bit different. It's, it's in my mind, it's the eaches uh, that it's going to take to pull together uh, multi-domain battle and its application uh, broadly to uh, uh, COCOMs uh, around the world. And that's a little bit of uh, a different perspective. And I think what, what drives the perspective here in the Pacific is making sure that we understand uh, what the ends are. Uh, so if, if we think first about what the ends are, then it drives us to what are the elements of uh, multi-domain battle that are, that are most important to achieve those ends specific uh, to our interest, uh, those of us uh, that call the, uh, the Pacific home. And it puts us in a little bit easier position. I would suggest uh, General Brown's position is a little bit uh, easier than uh, General Milley's and that he has to look uh, broadly across the entire world where Bob can uh, focus singly on the, uh, the challenges that, uh, that we face here. I want to footstomp uh, some of the points that have been made already uh, and that is it's, it's not about one service developing a, a capability. So we, we conduct a, a packed fleet uh, conducts the, uh, the largest maritime exercise uh, in the world, which is RIMPAC. And it was still, we'd, we'd just barely come off the backside of the last RIMPAC um, when, when, from my perspective, may not be true from the Army's perspective, but uh, Bob has kind of had the lead on behalf of the Chief of moving forward with, with multi-domain battle. I think one of the reasons is, from, from our perspective up here, it has such relevance to the challenges that we face. And Bob and I started talking about, hey, what, what do we need to do to incorporate uh, elements of multi-domain battle within the context of, of RIMPAC? Um, because it, it, it's a perfect exercise uh, to do that. So the point there is, is uh, first of all, it's not about one service. It's about all the services, uh, certainly here in the Pacific. Um, and it's, and it's about integrating it. So RIMPAC isn't the goal. RIMPAC is just a step along the way. And what are the steps that we need to take um, starting now moving forward? And there are elements of, of uh, multi-domain battle that are at play today in a whole host of exercises that uh, we conduct on a regular uh, basis. Um, it's also important to note that it's, it's not just about a few uh, high-end demonstrations of, of what we can do with integrating what have been traditionally Army fires into uh, joint fires. While those are important to drive the point home of the immediate value that multi-domain battle brings to us, it goes all the way down to the uh, soldiers, sailor, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardmen that are, that are carrying the fight forward on a daily basis, and, and you've heard that theme uh, stressed uh, from all of the speakers. It's that, it's that penetration that we need to get of the understanding of what multi-main uh, battle brings to the war fight uh, here in the Pacific, um, from four stars, from O-10s, uh, all the way down to, uh, to E-1s. Um, the, uh, the other point uh, that, that, uh, that I would make is, uh, is the fact that uh, we, in, in the Navy, there's a, uh, there's a theme about, uh, and it's spoken regularly, I'm not sure how uh, familiar this audience is with it, but uh, uh, um, distributed lethality. And it's really about, uh, much as the same comment that General Perkins uh, made in the information domain, it's the same thing that we're uh, trying to do in the, in the more traditional warfighting uh, domain of making every platform that we own lethal, platform being human platforms, hardware platforms, software platforms, uh, every one of them is, uh, is lethal, so they all must be considered um, by any adversary uh, that we must, must face, and, and we refer to that to distributed lethality. Um, there's another, uh, there's another view uh, out there that, that I've been pushing is full spectrum superiority, and I first had this discussion with, uh, with Admiral Harris, and uh, there was some thought about, well, wait a minute, let's, let's flesh this out a little more fully and make sure that we're uh, aligned from a, a doctrinal perspective. And it, um, as it turns out, uh, full spectrum superiority is actually a joint term. So uh, um, I'll, close on, I'll close on that point. 
um, in that much of the effort that we've taken on, I, I think broadly as components, and certainly for myself and, and uh, General Brown, um, it's not new discovery. There's not new doctrine that's necessary out there. Um, there aren't new systems that are required. When you look at it uh, from a, a warfighting perspective at the, the warfighting staff level, uh, bureau, bureau, uh, boards, bureaus, centers, and cells still works. We have fire cells um, that we manage uh, these types of fires uh, through. There is, there is going to be um, some software uh, requirement in order to manage these systems, and we've got some challenges within the Navy. We develop our, as already been talked about, acquisition. Um, we develop our weapon systems uh, within stovepipes internal to services. Uh, so we develop track fire files against the target that, that we want to conduct fires against, whether it's kinetic or non-kinetic fires. And oftentimes I've got uh, two systems with capabilities um, to reach out and touch that contact, but there's a, a data element that's missing within that track that one system can't fire on. Um, so whether you're talking about uh, an aircraft that's carrying a AMRAM or um, some other uh, type of missile, whether you're talking about a surface ship that's shooting SM-2s, SM-3s, and, and soon-to-be SM-6s, as Bob said, I've been an advocate that uh, I want weapon systems that are uh, weapons agnostic and weapon systems agnostic. If there is a threat out there, I want to be able to reach out and touch that threat with any system that falls within its weapons engagement zone. Um, so I had an interesting discussion. I know uh, General Brooks is, is uh, pushing this concept on, on the pen, and he and I were, were having a conversation uh, one day, and I was talking about we've got these disparate uh, systems that exist on the peninsula right now. We've got Green Pine radar. We've got e Na U.S. Navy Aegis systems. We've got Rock Navy Aegis systems. We've got... Patriot, we've got THAAD, we've got all these systems out there. What we need is a, it's actually a program that uh, my counterpart uh, on the East Coast, uh, General Davidson, is, is pushing, uh, which he refers to as the tactical grid. Um, so you've got an electronic grid out there that's formed by sensors. It can be human sensors, electronic sensors, EO sensors, any number of sensors out there that builds common track files that any weapon system can shoot on. And so the fire cells, it it's, uh, becomes a task of uh, pairing uh, a weapon against a track. And what that does for you, for the efficiency and effectiveness uh, of warfighting, it deepens your magazines, it deepens the options that uh, a commander has available. And it gets to the important point that, uh, that Bob mentioned as well, the importance of mission command. So the expectation my expectation here in the Pacific is that we're going to have to command and control through mission command um, because we're going to be operating in a comms denied environment. Our ability to communicate um, very far, uh, very deeply down through the uh, command structure is going to be episodic uh, at best and uh, most probably uh, limited in, uh, in general. Um, so all this multi-domain discussion uh, nests neatly um, within a broad family of discussions that have been going on in the Pacific. But uh, I commend uh, the Army and, and General Brown in particular in using multi-domain <coughs> battle to sharpen that discussion that's going on already. And it, it affects uh, not just uh, what the Army is bringing to the war fight here in the Pacific, um, but what the Navy is, uh, what the Marine Corps is, uh, what the Air Force is, um, and what our uh, coalition partners are uh, as well. So thank you very much. Sir, thanks. <laughs> General Shaughnessy. Yeah, thank you. Let me start by thanking uh, General Hamm and General Brown for this awesome opportunity to, uh, to talk to this, this crowd about an incredibly important subject for us out here in the, in the Pacific. And, as we continue to advance our thinking on uh, MDB, I think this theater is uh, very applicable. And I don't know that we could have a better group of folks up here uh, within the Pacific uh, to take some of this on. And as I look at some of my uh, leadership up here with me on, on the panel, as well as uh, my sister and brothers in the, in the service component side, uh, there has never been uh, uh, that sense of collaboration as high as it is uh, now. And so if, if we can ever had an opportunity to advance our thinking on this in a collaborative way, 
Uh, now is the time within the Pacific. And so with that, I'm really grateful for uh, Bob Brown for bringing this forward and giving us an opportunity to participate uh, in this forum. But I, I, can't, I can't be in a crowd of uh, Army uh, personnel such as this and, and not uh, at least casually mention the service academies and the football. And, you know, <laughs> it's, it's just been a good year for Air Force in that regard. So um, I just can't, I can't let it go. So uh, I do want to talk a little bit, though, from the, from the lens of the Joint Force Air Component Commander, so not from the Air Force perspective, but the Air Component Commander, and, and, and specifically how it, that results in our ability to support the Joint Force Commander, because at the end of the day, that's what we ought to be focusing on, not either our services and not our, just our individual components, but how does it ultimately allow the Joint Force Commander to reach his objectives or her objectives? And specifically, uh, for, the, for these comments, I'd like to kind of focus this on the MDC-2, the multi-domain uh, command and control part of MDB. And as I think this is a critical part of it that we need to, to advance our thought, just as we're advancing our intellectual thought on it, uh, we also have to advance our ability to work the command and control part of it. And one of the ways, one of the things I want to highlight is just literally as we speak right now uh, within the Air Operations Center at uh, Joint Base Pearl uh, Hickam, uh, we have... Uh, our airmen, soldiers, sailors, and Marines uh, working uh, some of the command and control throughout the Pacific. And whilst many of you think of an AOC as an Air Force provided asset, it is actually a joint asset. And literally one third of the personnel within the AOC right now uh, are joint. There's 130 uh, soldiers, sailors, and Marines in that AOC right now uh, doing the business. And so my point is we have to take this and leverage off of this because our teams know how to do this. Our teams know how to integrate joint fires. Our teams know how to work collaboratively, collaboratively to come up with joint solutions. And we have to take advantage of that. And we also have ties to our combined side. We have our Australians with the AOC. We have our combined AOC in, in critically important right now in the Korean Peninsula with the chaos there. Uh, we have our Japanese partners that are building that capability uh, within their system. And so we have an opportunity here, not to say that this is the end all, it's not, but it's a great place to leap off of as we look at the command and control aspect uh, of our ability to command and control if we really are able to bring the multi-domain battle uh, to fruition. And I know we have a lot of industry partners here, and I'll, I'll kind of piggyback on what uh, Admiral Swift mentioned relative to our ability to tie these things together and not develop things in a stovepipe manner. But right from the beginning, we ought to be developing our systems designed from the beginning, designed from the start, to talk to each other, to be collab to, to have weapon systems that are collaborative in nature, that can, that can right from the beginning, not work through a gateway, but right from the beginning, uh, talk uh, to each other. And even in 2017, you wouldn't think that we would still be fielding weapon systems that can't talk to each other, but we are, and we routinely do that. So to my pledge to my industry partners out there uh, is to let, let's get after this and let's really focus our attention on our ability to work all the way from the command and control piece all the way down to the weapons to provide us with the technology that allow us to bring all this together. Uh, and then as we, look at, as, as we look at some of the things we're doing every day, just in the recent exercise we did right here in the Pacific, uh, we, have, we had over 50 instances of dynamic targeting uh, working in the joint domain uh, to work in a real-time fashion to bring together the joint fires and bring the Joint Force Commander solutions that take the best weapons available, the best platforms available, irregardless or regardless of the the service or the component that was bringing them forward in order to meet the Joint Force Commander's um, objective. And we have the Boards Bureau of Cells working groups in order to tie that together. We have the C2, some of it, to tie that together already. But we need to further advance this capability and further advance our thinking with regards to how we bring it all together from a command and control place. And then as we look at it from a, from a certainly from an operational tactical piece, we really have to make sure that we're not losing sight of the end state. Uh, these new concepts can't just apply to tactical and operational endeavors. They have to ultimately apply uh, to the strategic and ultimately the strategic end states that we're trying to achieve. And our chairman says, Chairman Dunford says, one of the key deliverables of the joint force is to deliver viable options to our national command authority. And so I would add in this era that we're in today, the U.S. cannot project power globally uncontested like it has in the past. So we have to, we have to advance our thinking on this and we have to advance the way that we're approaching these problems. And so to me, this includes uh, leveraging our current 
joint fires capability and our joint integration that we have, AOC being one example of that, there's many others, um, but we, off, we have to bring this to a new level. We have to bring the MDC2 to a new level that will support the multi-domain battle concept. We also need to increase our operational maneuver. We have to be able to maneuver ourselves differently than we have in the past. And for the air component, we're looking at the, we call ACE, or uh, Agile Com uh, air, for us try to work on the Agile Combat Employment that allows us through operational maneuver to support the joint force. But again, you can't do that without multi-domain command and control so that we can synchronize all that operational maneuver that's gonna have to happen in a comms denied and maybe even uh, or degraded uh, fashion. And the one thing that's gonna allow us, us to be able to provide that national command authorities with those <laughs> options is if we are able to work collaboratively together, that we can bring the joint fires together, we can bring the operational maneuver together in a manner that is all working towards the same strategic objective that provides multiple strategic dilemmas to our adversaries that ultimately get to the end state. And so I really look at this as an exciting time here in the Pacific because we certainly have lots that we can apply this thinking to. Our problems out here are complex. Our problems out here cannot be solved by a single service or a single component. They have to be addressed jointly and combined. And so that forcing function, I think, makes this the perfect place to really advance our multi-domain battle thinking and the application of it here as warfighters. And so let me, again, thank uh, the opportunity from General Ham, General Brown to, to give some perspective here, but even more importantly, let me thank my component uh, commander uh, that are here with us for the work that we've we have done and the work that we're going to do uh, to advance this thinking and to be able to do that together. Thank you. General Yu. Uh, good morning and uh, thank you for allowing me to participate in this panel. Uh, I'm the uh, tail end Charlie of this August panel here and uh, in the interest of time, I'll keep my remarks brief. Um, you know, I read General Brown's uh, paper and, and all the other documents produced by the other components in a bio service, especially regarding multi-domain battle. And I think for most of us, uh, certainly in the infantry, this concept of uh, integration of fires across domains is not new. Um, and a lot of work has gone into a lot of in intellectual development as well, too. I think the uh, joint integration uh, peop uh, technology and people are three key elements that General Brown highlighted and others have talked about as well, too. From a soft perspective, especially in this theater, um, we're the only component that is joined by organization and structure. Um, uh, we, as the theater special operations component command, we have elements of all the services representing all the domains here too. And quite honestly, we're tasked of, to execute special operations across the continuum. Uh, from, the, from the perspective of, of zero, you know, from phase zero, steady state to a high end. And I think when you talk about multi-domain battle, a lot of the conversation focuses on what we would say phase three, the kinetic portion of, of, the, of the battle here. Um, on, on the joint integration piece, I think uh, we've talked a lot, uh, I think as a community, and certainly in this venue, it's a great opportunity about the I3 concept, uh, interoperability, integration, and interdependence. And, and I think uh, we will never get there unless we continue to experiment in, in these venues and others like uh, like uh, uh, RIMPAC that's coming up as well, too. Um, from, my, for, from our perspective here, technology is just an enabler of our, of our people on the ground. It's really about the human domain, what SOFT talks about. It's about getting out there, and, and here within PACOM, we have persistent presence in 17 of the 36 nation, nations within the area of responsibility that Admiral Harris is, is charged with. At the same time, from a global perspective, SOF has persistent presence in about 80 countries on a daily basis with up to eight to 10,000 operators on the ground. And it's really about studying, understanding, planning and coordinating, and then if, if necessary, executing with our partners and our interagency leadership that we fall under within those countries under the chief of missions. Um, and then being able to assess the effects and being over correct and take action again. So when, when you look at the cultural aspects, the social, the informational, the physical, and psychological elements of the human domain that influence human action, uh, that's where SOFT really is focused on. It's about developing the people, understanding the construct of mission command, 
and commander's intent being decentralized and being leverage, leveraging capabilities that are provided by the host nation and what the joint force brings on a daily basis. So uh, the development of the human domain, when you look at, if you look at a globe and you layer the, mar the maritime subservice, the land continental domain, the air and space, and you encompass the globe with what has now become the non-traditional but really traditional elements of, uh, of capabilities of power, which is really the informational slash cyber that we see on a daily basis. It's about harnessing those capabilities regardless of who is in charge of the domain. It's really about effects on the battlefield. So I, I think on, on the persistent presence with our PACOM augmentation teams in those countries uh, that we have developed relationships with that have common interests um, and common objectives, uh, the collaborative nature of that integration is what's going to get us there. Technology, like I said, is an enabler. And, and quite honestly, I think we've seen our adversaries today, uh, mostly non-state actors that have leveraged some of this low-end technology and put us in a dilemma that we really should search for as a combined force in order to leverage uh, our superior uh, capabilities. Uh, anything from the, the, the simple counter UAS challenge that we're facing within CENTCOM AOR. I think when you talk about concepts like multi-domain bottle, when we talked about this probably a decade ago, I think the Secretary Work was on active duty at the time, and we talked about swarm tactics, about using unmanned aerial vehicles attacking uh, attacking large platforms out there when A2AD, A2AD was really a buzzword. When we talked about the revolution of military affairs, you know, when, when the peace dividend came in here, I think these were things that were predictable that we knew that were going to come. And I don't think we leveraged this uh, capability in our adversaries are right now. I think the other technology that we need today as well is signal, signature management, you know, as far as platforms. I, I think we know right now, not just the platform, when I say platform from a soft perspective, it's the individual. Um, because we are going to be in a situation where some of our comparative advantage, especially when you talk about C2 in the space, it is going to be degraded and sometimes shut off. And I think we've seen that in exercises as well, too. So uh, I'll stop there and uh, uh, allow the the panel to take questions. But again, thank you very much for allowing us to participate. I think this is an important dialogue we have, especially in this venue with so many of our international partners here. Thank you. So this, uh, and by the way, thanks for the great questions. We got about 15, 20 minutes, so I'll, I'll try to uh, manage a little bit of time here. The uh, first question actually is gonna go to General Perkins and General Brown, and then to uh, General Okabe. Um, for Admiral uh, Swift and General O'Shaughnessy and uh, General Yu, I would ask if you want to bring your perspective from uh, the service contribution to this, because you know your organizations better uh, <clears throat> than we do in the Army, uh, then that would be applicable from the Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps and or soft perspective. So a lot of uh, discussion and some, um, some framing here. So the, the question's really a lot of comments about how does this concept um, apply to the gray zone actions that are going on. General Perkins talked about the three-dimensional decisions that have to be made uh, with speed. So really, the, and a lot of discussion about technology and people, but there's organizational impacts here, and I think that's the, where this question is headed. So, so uh, General Perkins, and I know TRADOC is working on a number of these things, but these things, uh, what current organizations either support or do not support uh, the, this concept of multi-domain battle that we currently have in the Army. And uh, addition to that is how does the impact of AI support potentially the systems that we are going to either acquire or the organizations that we have to adjust in the Army. And I would ask you, sir, to take that from a trade -off perspective, and then General Brown, you could take that from an organizational perspective, and then ASCC, and then to General Okabe, sir. So, thanks, Mike. So, again, in <laughs> trade -off, what we try to do is develop a dot mill PF solution to problems, doctrine, organization, training, leader development, material. And so the question, I think, was what organizations don't contribute to it and which ones do? Um, well, we, we haven't been it out like you're the non-multi-domain icons and you're the <laughs> multi-domain icons, et cetera, like that. 
I have some names of individual people, but I won't <laughs> go there. Um, uh, and so everybody contributes to it. Uh, but what we are doing, and I think Bob talked about this, is sort of an evolutionary process. So as we look at multi-domain and, and the aspects of it, what becomes critical, and you talked about gray portion or hybrid or whatever, is that different domains bring different capabilities at different times. And so as we look into our icon, what we want to make sure is that icon really at all levels uh, has access to all of the domains. They may not have organic capability to actually bring that to fruition, but they have access to all of that. And so we're, we're working with Bob and the folks here for multi-domain task force and so if you look at the headquarters, there's going to be the ability to access space and cyber as well as maneuver and fires and all that. It'll be at some levels will have an organic, you know, ability to maneuver in that domain. Other aspects of it basically have an input where someone plugs into it. But it's very interesting. Cyber comes up all the time because it's, it's apparently different than ground maneuver. And so as soon as you say cyber, oh, that's, that's different. And we got to think about it differently, and, and actually, just as a former armor, armor officer, I try to simplify and say, no, it's actually very similar. Well, you know, it's secret, it's special, you have to be special people, it has special authorities, everything like that, we've got to keep it over here to the side, stuff will happen behind the black curtain in Constantina Wire, and so that's, you know, it's a different way of doing business. I said, well, that, that's part of the problem, because when you, when you, when you, you know, you over-domain yourself. You're doing exactly what the enemy's trying to do. Well, only these guys do cyber, and every now and then we'll send an LNO over, and he'll, you know, let the infantryman and the armor, like, in on the secret. I say, well, w that's the problem. We we've got to get past that. And so both from a doctrine organization, training leader development part, for an example, I said, I'm sure when they first invented gunpowder, it was the big secret over here. It was over in a skiff. No one got to see it or use it. Give the arrows to all these guys here. We're going to keep the gunpowder over here. And only special people that have, you know, uh, top secret clearance will get to use the gunpowder at key times. Well, we've kind of moved beyond that. And now everybody's got gunpowder. We give it out. It's in little shells, et cetera. So we, we've, we've, got to, we've got to do the same thing with all of our domains, cyber, et cetera, like that. You know, the, the infantrymen, they don't make gunpowder. They don't even know what's in the uh, chemical solution, et cetera, like that. They're not even really sure how it works. All they know is they take this bullet, and they put it in the rifle, and they pull the trigger, and they get to use the effects of gunpowder. Okay. Well, that's really has got to be the same with all of our domains. That we just so in the infantry, the way they plug gunpowder into their organization is via a rifle. That's how they bring that capability into it. They know just put this capability in, pull the trigger, and you'll get an effect. Well, we need to do that same thing with space and cyber and all that. You don't have to have exquisite knowledge and understanding, but you got to have a way to bring it into the infantry squad or the armor platoon and get an effect out of it. And so I, I'm trying to sort of demystify that and figure out how we go about sure. doing that. General Brown. Uh, what, I, what I would add is uh, I, I agree with uh, Dave. I certainly wouldn't. Uh, I don't see any organizations. It's really interesting folks say, well, obviously, even in discussions throughout the theater with uh, uh, interagency uh, ambassadors, they, they understand. They say this makes sense. The good news is, as uh, General O'Shaughnessy said, and Admiral Swift said, and uh, General Yu, uh, we've, as uh, uh, PACOM, uh, we're very fortunate to be pushed by a commander who gets it, the PACOM commander, and, and we understand the challenges we have here, we cannot solve alone, none of us. We have to work together. I think we would anyway, but it's it's pretty uh, unique situation that we're, we, we must work together in that uh, joint integration and multinational uh, combined efforts, as was mentioned, and that integration. And I, and I love the idea, if you think about it, you know, the, as was mentioned again, weapon system agnostic, uh, and uh, it doesn't matter who's the sensor, who's the shooter, uh, that's where we need to get if we're going to handle these complex problems. I think artificial intelligence was the other part of that. Sure. And that is a, has a huge role. And I, I don't believe, like some people say, someday it'll be just machines fighting against each other. Maybe some nations will go to that. I don't think the United States will ever. Certainly you need to leverage artificial intelligence to help you make decisions faster. But there will always be a requirement uh, for a human being in the loop because no machine will ever have the empathy required, the judgment in split-second 
uh, decisions. They certainly can help uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, they can certainly help uh, searching uh, through big data and helping cull through those, uh, uh, as, as General Perkins mentioned, to find those needles uh, out there and that haystack of info. And uh, when it's a whole bunch of needles, how do you find the needle? Uh, they're going to they're going to require that help for artificial intelligence, but I don't see the day where uh, you know we give up uh, that uh, where machines make the decisions. Uh, not not going to happen. But a key aspect of it, and uh, certainly needs to be integrated into this concept. General Kabi, sir, organizational adjustments maybe that the Japanese are making as uh, as you approach multi-domain battle. Since there, is, since there is no script for the uh, answer to the question, I would like to use the interpreter. あの、ま、先ほどちょっと出ます。あの、新しい編成の問題もちょっとあるんですけど、私の方は今直面している問題として、SSM の問題が今非常に大きな問題になってます。あ、it has been mentioned that about the re organizing uh, of our uh, ground self defense force i just wanted to mention about the ssm この、ssm was initially equipped to the only ground self defense force in japan uh, in a uh, uh, cold war era to compel the enemy uh, along the uh, seashore uh, while they're landing to our territory. え、このお、SSMを、まさにモータイドメンバトルという中で、え、ドメインをクロスドメインをして運用しようとした時に、やはり、え、海上自衛隊、航空自衛隊との連携という問題もさることながら、我々陸上自衛隊内における指揮統制
people like to put utmost effort to uh, conquer. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Uh, this next question would be for, let me uh, start with General O'Shaughnessy and then to Admiral Swift, but uh, gentlemen, if you can take both of this, or both of you take this. So as we train and exercise <clears throat> on multi-domain battle, how do we better improve the integration of cyber and space domains into the exercises, given some of the policy and authority limitations? And do our policies, or are they agile enough and flexible enough to adapt to this concept as we train and exercise? Yeah, great so great question. And uh, let me start by just highlighting, I do believe exercising is going to be one of the key components to further advancing uh, this from intellectual thinking to pragmatic warfighting capability. And so I think exposing our young warriors, our airmen, soldiers, sailors, Marines that are out in the field to very complex uh, and dynamic exercises uh, to force them to think this way is how we will ultimately uh, really advance our, our thinking on this. Um, so with that in mind, I, I do believe that the, the, there are some policy um, restrictions that, that do impede some of those very exercises that you mentioned, uh, but we've gotten around that in, in some pockets of excellence. And so I'll use a couple examples. Uh, certainly our, our uh, northern edge uh, construct that we're trying to do gets after some of that uh, of trying to bring the new and innovative approaches to what we're doing. We have our red flag um, where we run some of our, um, in a joint environment, we run our space, we run our cyber, uh, and we do it at the highest classification levels. The challenge is it may, it may limit the audience who participates, but nonetheless, we are able to expose it to a broad enough view that we can really advance our thinking. And every time we run one of those exercises, uh, we significantly advance the ball and the integration of those effects into real operational challenges. And so to that end, I believe that those types of endeavors that we're doing that we can bring into the broad exercise construct, not just the one-off special exercises we do, and expose more of our young warriors to them uh, will allow us to further our thinking. Great, thanks. So uh, it, is, it is a great question. And I, I, uh, again, I speak to the, to the value of... Uh, of the conference here, I'm, I'm going to steal General Perkins' uh, gunpowder analogy. I think I think it's it's elegant in its uh, simplicity, and I think the answer to the question is uh, is found in, in his characterization. Um, and that and that w we need to we need to make cyber uh, like gunpowder, uh, but that's not uh, that's not the case. So uh, when I have uh, this discussion. Um, you know, I like making polarizing comments and drive the discussion out from there because we just don't have the time to talk about marginal discussions. We need to get to the uh, to get to the core issues. So uh, here goes. Um, the, the the challenge that we have with cyber is authorities. That uh, none of us have the authorities, and even Admiral Harris doesn't have the authorities really necessary uh, to execute uh, cyber fires in the uh, time and tempo that's that's required to keep up with the the war fight that. That, uh, that we would face uh, here in the, uh, in the Pacific. Um, and so then it gets down to the question of how do you get those authorities, you know, recognizing uh, that those authorities are global in nature. Uh, that's, that's why they're held at a higher level than the, uh, than the component commander, largely. Now, there's great work that, uh, that uh, Admiral Rogers is doing and on, uh, on the Navy side uh, what Fleet Cybercom is doing and putting cells in place to give us access to those fires. But again, those cells need to fall in within the fire cells and, and the timing and tempo of those fires need to be coordinated with all fires. And without the authorities to pull the trigger in that rifle, um, then those, those fires are going to become disconnected. Uh, so the polarizing comments I make that when it comes to defensive cyber, I think we're well positioned because we have the ability, the authorities uh, to defend our systems. But when it comes to offensive fires, we don't have those authorities. So I, I'm really not interested as a packed fleet commander in offensive cyber fires, unless you're willing to give me those authorities. Um, I made a suggestion uh, back uh, when I was a J3 at PACOM and tried to uh, generate a cabal with my fellow J3s uh, across all the component commanders to advocate uh, for a cyber JOA. And I, I remain, uh, and it went nowhere. 
Um, I remain convinced that we can create a cyber Joe, and it's critically important from a warfighting perspective if you realize that, at least in my view, that a JOA is a, is a container for command and control, and it's a container for authorities, that a local commander can take more risk than what a regional or a AOR-wide uh, commander is willing or, or is able uh, to take. And that gets us uh, to this point of uh, delegating authorities down to a more uh, subordinate level. So those are the, those are the challenges, I think, from a cyber perspective. We got it. We got to take it out of the, the bottle and treat it like it's uh, something special, as uh, General Perkins uh, so uh, eloquently described, and make it just another tool that's in our toolbox. Sir, yeah, Charlie. Please. One last thing on that. Th this comes up a lot in, in in kind of building upon what I said. As we develop capability and train it, we we have to separate the authorities piece from how do you develop doctrine, training, leader development, et cetera, like that. Uh, because otherwise, you, you just get, you just bind yourself up. So as a young armor brigade commander, when I went out to the National Training Center and General Thurman's out there patiently trying to coach, teach, mentor me, and he said, okay, Perkins, here's your mission. You have to attack into Krasnovia. I didn't say, well, sir, you know, that's beyond my authority as a brigade <laughs> commander. That's crossing international boundaries. I'll start an international conflict. <clears throat> so he's like, hey, Perkins, you just figure out how to do two up and one back, et cetera. You know, whether, I just need to know you, to be, you can do that. And then if the authority is ever giving to you, then you will execute that. So we talk about as if the authority piece only occurs in cyber and there aren't special authorities needed for where you can sail ships, where you can drive tanks, where you can fly aircraft. There's authorities needed for everything. So we just, we do have to separate that and we have to develop the capability, the doctrine, the organization, training and leader development that if the authorities are given or the permission is given, that is already already trained and ready to execute. But to say, I'm not going to train it until I get the authority to actually invade a foreign country, until I get that authority, I'm not going to how uh, train how I do it. We don't do that with anything else. I'm not sure why we do it with cyber. Hey, Thanks. Sir. Thank you, sir. Dan. <clears throat> I just want to comment on a couple things on, on the cyber discussion here. First of all, I think we do exercise defensive cyber in exercise, large-scale exercises. Um, but it, it's only, I think, unilateral you know, from a U.S. perspective because of the authorities' discussions we're having. I think we need to expand that with the, the uh, international partners we have out here. I think the, uh, the other aspect of it, the authorities is always an issue, but there's a process, and people need to understand the process. I think uh, a lot of people don't understand the process, and then there's, there's equities at stake from other agencies as well. But I think when you talk about offensive cyber operations, I think we've seen real-world applications at different levels of classification, uh, certainly from our adversaries as well, too. And, and I think uh, the authorities that we're bounded by from the United States are not necessarily the same for our partners out there. And it's common knowledge in some cases because some of it falls under law enforcement and other, uh, other uh, organizations that have responsibilities for that. So I think we need to talk through that in, 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 in the exercise in order to do that. The, the other aspect of it, too, is I don't think we need to, uh, contrary to what Admiral Swift says, my opinion is cyber is another fire. It's an effect out there. I don't think we need to create another deconfliction method other than what we normally do for fire support coordination measures. Cyber should be in support of maneuver uh, unless we decide they become the main effort for a certain portion of the campaign as we move forward. And the final thing I, I would say is, in order to use cyber, because in my view, cyber is a precision tool like other fires as well, too. And it can provide you dilemmas that are not just from the military perspective. There are other elements of national power and, and uh, value to certainly some of the state actors we're talking about right now, but uh, also from a non-state actor perspective that we're dealing with, that without the ability to leverage artificial intelligence, social media analysis tools, these things because we have a plethora of information now. And it's being able to sort through that information in a timely manner so that you can isolate, because what we're talking about is isolating the effects we want so that we can de-escalate as quickly as possible so we don't go on into that high order. Certainly that's not what the United States wants to do in, in some of the partner nations that we may end up uh, employing our, our capabilities in their countries certainly don't want that e either in the long-term effect. So I, I just wanted to add that to the discussion yep. as we move forward. Uh, just two thank yous. One to the panel. Uh, again, I, as I mentioned earlier, 
Um, teamwork happens on a lot of levels, but I, you know, having bear witness to uh, these uh, these senior flag officers up here, I would just like to extend my thanks to you because I think we're going to solve this problem because of the the teamwork that all of you exhibit. So thank you very much, and uh, how about a round of applause for these great uh, leaders?